everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody. We're glad that you're here. Um, God, this is just so different, right? This is just this is so different, but it is good to see. We had a good time of worship this morning at 8.30, and it's nice to see you again, some new faces this morning. We got people in the parking lot, and if anybody has just driven up and is in the parking lot and listening in the parking lot, if you'd like a bulletin, uh, we have some uh, underneath the picnic shelf. So we're telling, you know, so I'm going to speak to you folks. I'm going to speak to the folks that are out in the parking lot, and then I'm going to speak to the folks that are joining us live stream. We're glad that you have joined us uh, uh, the uh, live stream on the internet as we worship our God this morning. It's, uh, this is just something new that I'm getting used to, but but um, it, it is good to worship our God. Um, just a couple announcements. If you notice on the inserts, I uh, want, want to tell people that we are doing a Rise Against Hunger meal packaging event. It's in a couple weeks on a Friday and a Saturday, and we still have a couple slots that we need to fill. Uh, for people to help out with that social distancing guidelines in place and so wanted to call that to your attention and then on the back side you can see uh, that we have um, we have some Bible studies going on uh, through zoom and uh, there's one that's going on at 1030 which uh, is in a half hour which you guys won't be able to make but there is one at 630 tonight with Bob Rockholt uh, leading if you'd like to tune into that you, know, you can you can get in touch with me and uh, after the service, and I'll give you the, uh, the uh, email to that, the, or the, web, the link to that that you can um, uh, link up to Bob's website. Uh, and then the other thing is, um, you know, we got these welcome cards, and, and so you know, to put them in your bulletin, and you know, this is just the way, since we can't, you know, haven't been able to communicate with folks like we normally would communicate, and so this is your way of communicating with me, and kind of letting me know that you're here, I can, I can remember you folks, but uh, sometimes out in the parking lot I can't. But just, you know, if there's anything you want to communicate with me, prayer requests, or hey, your church needs to know we're doing this, just, you know, and then you can drop them. And if you have any offerings that you want to give, just put them in the baskets on your way out. When you exit, you'll go out that way. So um, I think that's all that I have. And our call to worship this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 40. And um, I want you to think about, we just kind of get settled down here. Think about uh, what this says. <clears throat> it says, do you not know, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak, even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. So your lyrics will be on the screen, but they're also in here. And I know it's tough to sing with masks on, and maybe we shouldn't sing with masks on. But one thing you, could, you can still do is you still can worship, right? And I've learned to hum with masks on too and bob my head. So we're going to worship the Lord that strange it is as it is and Madeline's going to lead us. Take it away Madeline. Oh, Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. We will wait. 
I want to start off with something really cool. Uh, one of our church members, Emily Rhodes, turned 96 years old this week. And one of the ladies took it upon herself to round up a bunch of other ladies to go and sing happy birthday to Emily. And so uh, by all accounts, it was just out of this world of blessing and, and uh, you know, out of, out of the yard. They stood in the yard. And, and so she was blown away. So. Uh, and all that good stuff, and I, I just, I just um, um, makes a pastor proud that, that the church kind of does stuff like that. Is, is, is the church and reaching out and and uh, going beyond what we have to do in, during this time. So um, we want to remember Vicki Baker. Her sister passed away uh, early this morning. She had been in hospice. And this had been expected, but we still want to rem uh, keep Vicki and her mother and her family in our prayers. Um, <clears throat> we also want to remember um, our, our shut-ins. You know, this, this doesn't seem to be an end to this, and it goes on. Every time I talk to my mom, how you doing, mom? I'm bored. And because she can't come out of her, she's in assisted living, she can't come out of her two rooms at all. So um, that's really hard. Um, so we want to remember our shut-ins. We want to also remember um, with the, um, uh, you know, the $600 a week that is going away and the unsure about whether or not the, the president legally can do that, get $400 to replacement. But there's just talk about a lot of people facing eviction um, during these times. And, and uh, th these are tough times. And then when you get kicked out of your house, you know, that's just extra extra hard so we want to we want to pray for a resolution to this we want to pray for you know a healing uh, that this thing would just go away and um, um, so we just want to remember that um, I'm going to lead us in prayer and then at the end uh, we're all going to say the Lord's Prayer together uh, which is in your bulletin have it in your bulletin so yes ma'am okay Continued, continued prayers for Matthew and the house hunting. Yep. yep. Okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege of uh, being able to gather once again inside um, your house. Um, David talked about uh, the joy of going to the house of the Lord and worshiping. And it is nice to be inside worshiping, even though these are not normal times and this is not what certainly what we're used to but um, uh, it's one step closer to that and Lord um, uh, just with the songs that we sang we thank you uh, that we are able to praise you you have given us the the ability the mind and, and, and the thought patterns to think about how awesome you are in our life uh, we thank you for all the blessings that you have given us um, because you are awesome and you are majestic and mighty. Um, and so, Lord, we pray, we ask a special prayer for these folks who are on our prayer list and those who are going through challenging times right now. And, Lord, we uh, um, sometimes we're at a loss of words. Um, you know, this is certainly out of our ballpark for many folks on, on how to deal with it and what to do next. And, and we so wish that we could just sweep it underneath the rug, but we can't. And so, Lord, we pray that you would bring a healing to our nation. We pray that you would eradicate this virus. We pray that we would be uh, good neighbors and good citizens and reach out and help one another through this difficult time. Uh, Lord, um, open up our eyes and our hearts to those people who, um, 
who this is just an overwhelming situation. They don't know which way to turn. Lord, would you just guide us on how we might minister to them. Father, we pray for wisdom as we move forward. We pray for wisdom for our leaders of our nation as they make some important decisions on, um, on uh, helping our country to move forward in a positive way. Lord, we pray for protection from the evil one who wants to undo every good thing, every good gift that you have given us. And he wants to undo it and, and just to, uh, to bring strife between us. Lord, that is not from you. And so we pray that um, uh, we pray against all uh, Satan's works. And Lord, we now pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Madeline. You do a great job of uh, calming nervous hearts. <laughs> it's awesome. It's it's a little different being. It, it, it's nice being in here when you're out there, and she plays in here, and I'm out there, and I have to listen real closely because I can look here and say, "Okay, her hands are up. She's done." I'm out there. I don't know when she's done. I got to kind of like, hey, give me a cue. So, but uh, yeah, just all these adjustments that we're making. Hey, if you have your Bibles, 
turn to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. We continue to work our way through the book of Exodus, the story of God and his people. And lately we've been following the Hebrews as they have been traveling through the wilderness. And uh, I thought, you know, this is kind of similar for us. We find ourselves traveling through the wilderness of this pandemic as well. And uh, so th this is good. Find some similarities here. Back in 1980, there's a presidential debate between uh, then-candidate Ronald Reagan, and he used this particular phrase that he became, he kind of made famous, and he went on to use it a number of times. And he would use, it, use this phrase in a way that would disarm his opponent, uh, that would diffuse an attack that was made on him. And so in 1980, debate against uh, the incumbent president, Jimmy Carter, after Carter had accused him of uh, certain political stances and certain political beliefs, uh, Ronald Reagan, before he responded, and he said this, there you go again. I don't know how many of you remember that, but that was a phrase that Reagan had used. You know, there you go again. Uh, and as I went through today's scripture um, and the actions of the Hebrew people, uh, one of the first phrases that popped in my mind with what the Hebrew people were doing was, there you go again. It just seemed to be appropriate. And you may or may not agree with me. You might read this and go, what on earth is he talking about? But anyhow. So, Exodus chapter 17, we're going to read through seven verses here, and uh, uh, here we go. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin. Now, again, that sin wasn't the sin like we think it is the Hebrew transliteration, uh, transliteration of the Hebrew word sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. And they camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink, so they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, why, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. And they said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people, Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb, strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massa and Meribah, which translated means testing and quarreling, because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying... Is the Lord among us or not? So, back in chapter 14, if you recall, the uh, Israelite people were being pursued by Pharaoh and his army, and their response, complaining to Moses, was, What? Weren't there enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to die? And then in 15, chapter 15, they're asking him and complaining to Moses again, There's nothing to drink. Chapter 16, there was no food. They, they complained to Moses saying, you know, hey, back in Egypt we sat around pots of meat to eat. You know, it was never ended. Verse, then chapter 17, they're thirsty and they're complaining again. I can only imagine Moses just looking at those people and saying, there you go again, you know. Uh, but anyhow, sometimes when, when I come to passages of Scripture like this, I like to approach them, approach this and just say, all right, how should the people have reacted? I mean, you, they're thirsty uh, and, and they're you know, hungry and scared. And after many days of this, you know, you, you, you know what, what, what should they have done? You know, how should they have reacted? Should they have, you know, prayed? Should they just calmly gone up to Moses and just say, man, you know, my kids need some, something to drink. The dog is panting like crazy, needs some water. What, Moses, come on, what are we supposed to do? Should we pray some more? Should, is there any sacrifices that we are supposed to do that we, we don't know about? And so I'd like to think that they did all that, you know? I, I mean, that would be the normal thing that I would think to do, but maybe they didn't. Maybe they didn't. Maybe the writer, as he's telling us, that over and over and over again, the people are doing this. Maybe the people were just selfish people. 
Maybe they, they were complainers by nature, and so this is just the way that they reacted. They, they saw themselves as not being there to serve God, that God was there to serve them. And we find out later that most of these people, the Israelite people here that are traveling through the desert, they never made it to the promised land. That God actually had them wander around in the desert till that whole first generation of complainers had died. And so it's almost like maybe there is a right way to complain and a wrong way to complain. In the book of the Bible called the Psalms, where there is a collection of, of writings, which just kind of give you, read the Psalms, they give vivid pictures of life in all its aspects. You know, it's a beautiful, just a whole collection of Psalms, including, kind of shows us how to complain as well. And in Psalm 142, we find David, who was, had a, in a very disturbing situation in his life. He's on the run. Uh, he's hiding out in this cave from his enemies. He might have been hiding from King Saul, who was trying to kill him, hunt him down. And in the midst of this very threatening situation, David complains to God. And he writes it down for us to see and to read. And I think that in this Psalm 142, he reveals a right way to complain to God. So I want to look at that. If you can follow along in your Bible or in your outline. I also included this in, in, uh, in the outline. And let's look, at, let's look at in detail Psalm 142. He starts off by saying this. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. David is almost, you picture David just yelling here, crying out to God in pain and in, in anguish wanting to be heard, just appealing to God. And I think this is our first uh, step in the right way uh, of complaining to God, and that is this, to be open and real. To be open and real. A couple of years ago, I saw uh, one of our presidents, and um, this was on TV, and I don't remember which president it was, but they, they visited the Queen of England. But they kind of messed up when they visited the queen because they didn't follow proper protocols. You know, when you visit royalty like that, there are certain things that you're supposed to do. You know, you don't talk first. You wait for the queen to speak, and then you speak. You don't stick your hand out, you know. Uh, you wait till the queen extends her hands, then you can shake your hand. You don't call her Liz, you know, stuff like that. There, there's a certain formality and etiquette that you have to follow when you meet royalty. But in this psalm, um, that's not the picture that we get of God, of David going before God who is a king. He's not enthroned here. He's not a God who demands that we approach him a certain way or that we have our life all together before we approach him. That's just not the picture that's here. And Jesus himself showed us how we can approach God. As Jesus talked to God, he called him Abba, like Daddy, Father, right? Uh, and so he approached God with a freedom to share with whatever was on his mind. And so that kind of shows us, man, we can go to God with however we feel, what, whatever mood we are in. The problem is that we, we live in a society, though, that, that it's not cool to do that. It's just not cool to show your emotions or to express your feelings like that. We're kind of taught, man, you just got to grit your teeth and bear it and, and just push through the situation. Except Jesus never did that, right? Jesus, you think about who is our master and the one who we follow and the hardest part of his life, he, he asked three of his close friends to come with him as he went to the garden to pray and he told them, my soul is just about ready to explode. I can't take this any longer. And he began to pray and then he went over and he prayed. You remember how he prayed? God basically saying, I don't want to die on the cross. I don't want to have to go through this for, for these people. Take this cup from me, but your will be done, is what he said. So, I mean, he had the freedom to go to God and just say, I don't want to do this. And then when he hung on the cross, what did he say when he was on the cross? He cried out. Psalm 22, he quotes Psalm that he knew. God, why have you left me? Why have you left me? It's what he's crying out to God. So, just a wonderful picture of, 
of being open and real before our Heavenly Father. So the first step of complaining to God in the right way is to tell God how we feel. If you're angry, you're sad, or you're confused, we tell God that. Secondly is this, and that is to be specific. To be specific. Look at how David is specific. Starting in verse 2. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. Look and see. There's no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. Nobody cares for my life. Well, David sounds like a fun guy to hang out with right there. Doesn't he? I mean, this is like Debbie Downer, the male version of Debbie Downer. But look how specific he is there. Look at what he lists. People are, are sneaking around. They're out there conspiring against me, trying to trap me. Okay? I, I have no friends. I'm all alone. Nobody understands me. Okay? I can't. I'm, it's like I'm bare out in the open, no place to hide. Now, I think this is really interesting that we have a psalm of these feelings and these complaints because I think that's very therapeutic, even for David, just to write those out. It's one of the things I've discovered over the years, not that I've done it yet, but I've read about it. <laughs> the importance of journaling. I, you know, I read that that's really, really important in your life, that when you get through difficult, challenged times, you write down what you're feeling and what you're experiencing and all that sort of stuff. That is very, very helpful in helping you through that and to recover. And that's exactly what David is doing here. And so one of the ways we're going to complain in the right way, we want to be specific in our complaints to God. And then we're going to move down to verse 6. Look what he says. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Here's number three if we want to complain to God in the right way, and that's be humble. To acknowledge our weaknesses and our shortcomings. David is just crying out, I am in desperate need, I can't do it on my own. Um, and you know, that's in our Western society, that's another one of those things that is hard for us to grasp. Because we're not taught that, Right? We're, we're taught, hey, listen, you know, you, you don't take help, right? You, you, you don't admit that you need help. You, you just take a deep breath and pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. That's part of our Western society. Not really biblical, but that's part of the culture that we live in. But David here, it's an admission that he's telling God, man, I can't do this life on my own. I need rescue. The forces around me are too strong. He's just saying, God, I need help. And so I think in this aspect, a good place for us to begin is, is to confess. That's a good time for confession here. That, that we just say, God, first of all, we say, God, I need you to save me. I've maybe messed up my life. And, and God, I confess my sins to you. That's a, always a great place to start. But then if we need healing, we ask God for healing. God, I've got a situation in my life that... When I was young, it would heal itself and everything was good. But now I've got something that is beyond me. The doctors are, you know, I need healing. I can't do it. But God, I need healing. We cry out for wisdom. If there's a situation in life that is just so confusing, I don't know which way to turn. Do I do this or do I do that? God, I need wisdom. Give me some advice. If you need justice, right? If somebody did you wrong and it's just wrong and you just, you know, the flat out, then you... You ask God for justice. God, will you make this situation right? Everybody seems against me. You know, the law is on, that's a wrong law. That's it's just everything seems against me. God, would you grant me justice in this case? So complaining in the right way, I think an important step is that we are humble and we acknowledge in, our, in this situation our weaknesses and we cry out to God for help. And then number four is this. We acknowledge God's status and God's prominence in our life. He says in verse 5, I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Now he begins by calling God Lord there, which, um, which is kind of sometimes a foreign term to us. But, you know, back then it's Lord and servant or slave. Uh, we might say 
you know, we might equate Lord to being boss. And so we look at God and we just acknowledge, God, you're the, you're the boss of my life. You rule over me in my life. And as a Christian, we look at Jesus as our boss and that we will do what Jesus tells us to do according, according to his scripture. He, he shows us how to live. What we don't want to do is just live however we feel like living and then we turn around, something goes wrong, we expect God to bless however we live. Okay, um, there's a difference in calling Jesus Savior and calling Jesus Lord. Everybody wants to call Jesus Savior, right? We want Jesus to save us from hell and make sure we go to heaven and all that cool stuff. So we would acknowledge Jesus as Savior. Totally different thing to acknowledge Jesus as Lord of our life and Jesus as boss of our life. Because all of a sudden then we have to do what he says according to the scripture. So it, there's a difference there. And that's important because then when bad stuff happens, we're not blaming God because he screwed up our life or our plans, right? If we follow God for God because of who he is, then we're not ruined when something happens to us that we don't understand. We follow God because of who he is, not because of what we can get out of him, which is what the Hebrew people were doing, right? So uh, he, he refers to God as Lord. And then he says, you are my refuge. You are my refuge. Just some interesting terms that he uses to describe God. My daughter and I went camping last weekend for a night up at Big Meadows in Shenandoah National Park. Really cool to go camping there. Um, and we had a campsite sitting by the fire, and all of a sudden... Here comes this family of deer that go walking kind of right next door to our campsite. It's really not, you know, including two fawns you know, with spots and everything. And it was just like, they just come walking by, you know, nibbling a little bit, give us a little head nod like, how you doing? You know, it's just, it's, it was wonderful. But, you know, the deer can do that. They're not spooked by us because they are in this refuge where no one's going to chase them or hunt them down, and, and so they had, it's a place of safety and security. And that's how David saw God. He said, David, uh, is telling God, I'm in this bad situation here, and you are the only one who can provide me with real security. My life is ultimately, even though he's scared, hiding in a cave, he realizes my life is ultimately only safe with you. What a good word for us during these times that we look to God as our refuge. Right? I mean, can you say, God is my refuge? Because there are a lot of people that are struggling with that right now. There's a lot of people that are saying, man, um, my refuge is in that vaccine when it comes in a couple months. Or my refuge is in my, my bank account or in my retirement that I've got saved up. That is my refuge. Or some people are saying, my refuge is whoever's going to lead the country come November, man, if we get the right person in there, the right person stays in there, whatever, man, that is my refuge. Then I'll feel safe and secure. But Paul saw things a different way. In Romans chapter 8, he said this, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That was Paul's refuge, that God loved him. And man, he just he, he got to that point and just said, nothing's going to take that away from me. I'm secure in that. And then he says this, the Lord is my portion, which again, another weird thing to, to describe God. It's just odd here, but has a very theological meaning. And after, years after the uh, Hebrew people, as they got to the promised land, they divvied up, they divided up the promised land according to the different tribes of Israel. Everybody got a portion of land. Everybody got some inheritance to just live life and do things, right? Except one tribe, the tribe of Levi. They were the priestly tribe, and their job was to take care of the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle 
And they lived, since they didn't have any land, they lived off the tithes and the offerings of the others. And so they didn't have a portion of the land, but God told them this. He said this, I am going to be your portion. I am going to take care of all of your needs. And so this is what David is thinking about when he says, God is my portion. God, you are my most important possession in my life. You are the one that's going to satisfy me the most. Okay? Now, stop and think. Just, you know, stop and think how many things have brought us satisfaction in life. And I'm not talking about, these aren't bad things. But you talk about our families, right? We've got granddaughter. You know, she brings me joy and satisfaction in life. We've got uh, the hobbies and leisure activities, sports, uh, where we go on vacation and traveling and, and stuff like that. And how many of those have been removed by this pandemic? Right? We can't, it's difficult to visit family. And, and all, all those other things have been taken away. And it's almost like, like God has, has reminded us during this time that He, He is our portion. He is the most important thing in our life. So one of the ways that we complain in the right way is by acknowledging God's status and His prominence in our life and then living accordingly to that. And then number five, we need to envision a better future. Envision a better future. Notice what he says in the last verse, verse 7. He says, Set me free from my prison, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. Here's the hope. Here's the, you know, it's been depressing so far, but David has this line of hope as he's anticipating, man, one day I'm going to come out of this cave and I'm going to be able to worship you freely, God, out in the open. And my, my friends and family are going to be able to hang out with me. And it's just, I'm looking forward to that day. That's going to happen, God, one, one day. Aren't we saying the same thing with this pandemic, right? Aren't we looking forward to, God, we can't wait till this is over. And especially us as church people. To say, man, isn't this great that we can come in here with a couple people, but wouldn't it be nice if we get the whole family of God back in here again? When we don't have to wear masks and we can sing and bar praises to God, just like David's saying, when we can have potlucks again and, and hug people. And so David is just like, man, I'm looking forward to that. And when we complain, we want to have that little piece of, of good news that we want to look forward to as well. Hmm. But then look how it ends. If you're going to get one thing from me this morning, get this. Okay, look at the last line. He said, then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. In all this trouble, in all this running and hiding, and this disturbance in David's life, he still remembers that my God is good. My God is good. That is the key. If we're going to complain to God in the right way, that's the key to complaining to God in the right way, to remember that God is good. And then the last one simply is this. We leave the results up to God. We leave the results up to God. God continues to be in charge. He knows what's going on. And we've complained and we just left it up to Him. The barracks where Corey Ten Boom and her sister, sister Betsy were kept in the Nazi concentration camp of Ravensbrück were terribly overcrowded and flea infested. They had been able to miraculously, though, smuggle a Bible into the camp. And in that Bible, they had read that in all things they were to give thanks and that God can use anything for good. Well, Betsy decided that this meant thanking God for the fleas. Well, this was too much for Corey, who said she could do no such thing. Betsy insisted. So Corey gave in, prayed to God, thanking him even for the fleas. Well, over the next, next several months, a wonderful but curious thing happened. They found that the guards never entered their barracks. 
This meant that the women were not assaulted. But it also meant that they were able to do the unthinkable, which was to hold open Bible studies and prayer meetings in the heart of a Nazi concentration camp. Through this, countless numbers of women came to faith in Christ. Only at the end did they discover why the guards had left them alone and would not enter into the barracks. It was because of the fleas. Folks, after nearly five months of this pandemic, when we feel primed to complain about our nation's economy and the unemployment numbers and the debates about whether or not to open up businesses and open up schools, when we're ready to grumble over staying inside and going stir-crazy, soon to be inundated with the rhetoric of a, yet another presidential election, may we take a moment to remember the fleas of Ravensbrook. And may that lead us to complain to God in the right way. Let's pray. Father, when we are hurt, when we are pressed and stressed, we are apt to complain. But may our complaints come out of the fact that you don't owe us anything. And may they come out of the fact that you are a good God and have given us the good gift of Jesus Christ who went to the cross in our place and who was resurrected that we may live life like we've never experienced before. And so, Lord, we pray that this week may we rediscover, may we realize that you are our refuge, that you are really the only one that can provide us with safety and security. Lord, may, may we come to the, to the realization that you are our portion that a relationship with you is the most important thing in our life, that only that relationship will be able to satisfy us and bring us joy in this life. Teachings. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. It was good to see you today. It was so good to see you today. And yes, amen. Amen to that. <laughs> here's our benediction and, and when you head out just, just go ahead and head out head out those doors and um, that'll be good may God quench your thirst with love and comfort and compassion may Christ Jesus strengthen you and encourage you and may the Holy Spirit lead you on and make your joy complete amen go in peace have a great week everyone God bless you. <laughs> Amen.